Good Thanks for coming out. I'm Cleve Corner. I'm the manager of author and speaker engagement here at the Pratt. This is fantastic. Like, give yourself a round of applause. Like, there's 60 people here for a poetry reading on one of the nicer days we've had in a long time. So that's stupendous. I'm so happy about that. Um, so just a little bit about what's going to take place over the next hour and a half. Uh, our three featured poets will be reading first. They'll read for about 10 minutes each. Uh, and then we're gonna open it up to uh, our folks who are gonna be part of our open mic. Uh, our open mic registrants, you'll read in the order that you came in. And my colleague, Shailene Beyer, will be emceeing that portion of it and she'll call you up. Uh, I asked for the open mic. Uh, you need Your reading should be three minutes or under, okay? Great. A uh, Couple other things very quickly and then I'll get out of here and let Shailene take over. Um, Shailene put together a wonderful poetry uh, email list serve. Um, so if you're new to this community or you've been a part of this community for a long time and you just want more poetry information, this is a great place to get it. There's a sign up back here on your way out. Please sign up. Uh, Shailene is judicious about how many she sends out uh, and they're always informative and about programming and also about readings and discussions of poetry, all things poetry. So, without further ado, I would like to introduce my colleague, Shailene Beyer, who is a librarian in our Fiction and Humanities Department. Thank you so much. Great to see everyone here today. Happy National Poetry Month. Um, so, I'm so excited to introduce our three wonderful readers who will begin the event. And first up is Shirley Brewer. Shirley is the author of four books of poetry, including her most recent, Wild Girls. Her work has twice been nominated for a Pushcart Prize, and she has won prizes and honorable mentions for her poems from the Maryland Writers Association and several literary journals. Her poetry has appeared in the Cortland Review, the Cornstalk Review, Passenger, Slant, Poetry East, Tar River Poetry, Lock Raven Review, and many other journals and anthologies. Shirley serves as the resident poet at the Carver Center for the Arts and Technology in Baltimore County. And Shirley's new book is playful, colorful, and full of the music of history's beating heart. Please help me to welcome Shirley Brewer. Sometimes I get thirsty when I read. Hi, everyone. I just love this room. I feel there's a very special energy here. And welcome to everyone. I see some friends in the front row and other rows, too. So this is, um, I want to thank, first of all, thank Cleve and Sophia and Shailene and everyone at the Pratt for creating uh, opportunities like this for poetry, especially. You have to do it in National Poetry Month, you know. Um, and um, my book is called Wild Girls, it came out last June from Apprentice House Press here in Baltimore. And there are wild girls here from my family and from the news and current events and history and even make believe. So I'm happy to read with Joe Ross and Ed Doyle Gillespie. I thought I was gonna be in between them, but they're putting the thorn first followed by the two roses. So, uh, I'm going to start with a poem about a, a wild girl that I grew up with, my mother. And uh, she would be thrilled to know that I was starting the reading with a poem about her. And all you need to know here is the name Alfred Dunner. Does anyone know that name? He was a designer, uh, a, a clothing designer for women of a, a mature age. And my mother and aunt were very much in love with Alfred Dunner. What the Bride Wore, a white silk jersey gown 
close-fitting bodice, bouffant skirt of Marcusette, tulle halo in her hair. After the honey dropped off the moon, how mom told it, winking at dad, she accepted synthetics, her closet a department store paradise, lush with eye-popping shades of yellow and blue, an occasional red. Mom worshipped Alfred Dunner, adored his drip dries. She even whispered his name into holy water before Sunday mass. Silk's fine for the wedding, she said, but you ought to have plenty of polyester for the long haul. And going along with the theme, I guess, of clothing uh, in this book, um, I grew up in the 50s, 60s, and a person that I idolized very much was Jackie Kennedy. So I knew that I wanted to have a poem about her in this book. And this poem is called Jackie. One journalist called it Plum, the wool suit Jackie wore in Dallas. Everyone else said pink. Plum, its sad ending dies on our lips like a requiem, while pink bounces to the back of the throat. Color matters because that suit belongs to all of us. Now the ruined Chanel fabric hangs in a temperature-controlled vault, sealed for another hundred years, eternal couture, worn by a woman who sat next to her man in the open car, waving until our future blew up, became a crimson stain on her skirt, crimson on plum. And again, going along with the theme of the, the pink and now the clothing, we're so fortunate in Baltimore. We have these beautiful museums here um, and libraries too, of course. But uh, I live right near the Baltimore Museum of Art. And I spend time there. And I've written this poem. There is an artist by the name of Walter Henry Williams. And he um, did this painting called A Quick Nap which shows a little girl, well, the background is a tenement building, but there's this beautiful little girl in front and she's got a pink dress on, but she's got her eyes closed. And I, when I look at the painting, I wonder, what is she dreaming about? So this is called Girl in a Pink Dress. Gritty traffic sounds pummel summer air. Still the child dreams on a tenement balcony. Powered by pink against her brown skin, she transforms metal railings into a magic rug flying far above the fields of real and gold wind, winds fragrant as vanilla snow. Her cotton candy frock, a peppermint cloud confection. When night falls, stars shoot past, gilded ornaments resplendent against the metallic sky. At a tea party for the angel crowd, she plays pin the tail on the moon. Watch out for that silly cow jumping overhead. Soon it will rain giant drops of milk. At first, as first light dawns ballerina pink, she returns to her rusted home on shimmer dusted wings. And um, this is a short poem. You know, we all have like those birthdays that like the birthday and it's a little bit hard to face that birthday. You know, usually it's the turning of the decade. So this is also a poem about clothing, either what you wear or what you don't wear. So I won't say what birthday it was, but this is called Glitz at the Musee. Birthday apocalypse, uh, think I'll escape, I reappear in Paris in the 20s, wearing only stiletto heels and lingerie into the Louvre. A guard will smile, warn me not to touch anything. He won't see me fluff my curls with lavender oil from Provence or snap my scarlet garter behind the bust of one old pompous duke. And I'm going to close with a poem that I want specifically to read because uh, I do have poems from current events. And because I'm reading with Joe Ross and he, he writes a lot of poems, Martin Luther King and social justice. So I wanted to read this poem about Breonna Taylor and the name may 
resonate with you. Brianna Taylor uh, was killed by police four years ago in, in Kentucky uh, in a stupid police raid. And I really spent a lot of time reading about her life because I found out that she was born on the date of June 5th. And that was my birth, that's my birthday as well. And I've, I just felt like I had a, a connection with her. So I wanted to find out not just that she was a person in the news who'd been killed, but I wanted to find out a little bit who she was. And so what I did was I found out Brianna loved music from the 80s and 90s. And I went through all the music of that era and I picked out song titles that resonate with certain lines in my poem. So with uh, your indulgence, I'll read you the playlist first. And then when I read the poem, I think you'll, you'll hear the song titles. So here's the playlist for the poem is called You Are Not Alone. You Are Not Alone, Michael Jackson. Say My Name, Destiny's Child. Not Gonna Cry, Mary J Jane Blige. Broken Wings, Mr. Mister. Girl, I'm Gonna Miss You, Millie Vanilli. Didn't we almost have it all, Whitney Houston? Sweet child of mine, guns and roses. Nobody's supposed to be here, Deborah Cox. If I could turn back time, share. Every breath you take, the police. Don't you forget about me, simple minds. And there's an epigraph by the great Maryland poet, Lucille Clifton. Something in the girl is wakening. Something in the girl is falling deeper and deeper asleep. Lucille Clifton, begin here. You are not alone. Brianna Taylor, say my name. You and I shared the same birthday, June 5th, Gemini's. Wish we could have raised twin toasts. Not gonna cry. Did someone say a life rest nests in small moments? Broken wings. Brianna, Bree, I want to tell your story, how you loved your job in healthcare, playing skip bow and other card games with your aunts. Girl, I'm gonna miss you. Music from the 80s and 90s put a sparkle in your step. Didn't we almost have it all? Your aunt Tahasha called you cool, a cool cat. Definitely a diva, confides Tamika, your beloved mom sweet child of mine. You died March 13th, 2020 in Louisville, Kentucky, a reckless police raid. Nobody's supposed to be here. Age 26, black, shot six times, 1240 AM, three white officers, 32 bullets fired, 30 minutes after the shooting, if I could turn back time. EMTs checked your pulse. No pulse. A sliver of solace, Brianna, possibly in the hours before you were slaughtered, every breath you take. You lost yourself in the healing magic of song. Don't you forget about me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you, Shirley, that was amazing. Our next reader is Edward Doyle Gillespie. Ed is a Baltimore poet and writer. He is the author of several books of poetry, including his most recent, Father of the Red Grotto Used Bookstore. He holds a BA in history from George Washington University and a Master of Liberal Arts from Johns Hopkins University. He has worked in the fields of education and law enforcement. And he has won the first place in the Iridescence International Poetry Award and also has won an honorable mention for the Rhonda Gale Williford Award for Poetry. Ed's poems blend dreams and dailiness to reveal strange truths. Please help me to welcome Ed Doyle Gillespie.
Thank you so much. I'm just kind of reveling in this. I'm so excited that we're actually celebrating Poetry Month. This is awesome. So I'm really excited. Um, so a few pieces here. Um, I, I've ventured a lot into magical realism as of late. Uh, and that's something that's taken me in a whole different direction I've really enjoyed. And I kind of pair that with my interest in history and folklore. And so this kind of came out of that. This is actually, um, this is called The Actual Price of Her Bangles. She will run the whole way this time when the sea voices tell her to, chanting shanties, mouthing driftwood barracoon songs, she will run the whole way to the breakers. She will leap the seawall when the voices tell her to, the ankle bangles clanking against mosquito-worn flesh. She could tell you their whole story if you cared to hear, if the voices demanded that she recite their names and explain them across the breaking tide, the breaking time, and the clanking of bangles she found one morning lost in the cursed sands of the outer banks. They had staved off tarnish in time, ever gleaming, young, carrying the captive ma magic from the womb of a middle passage ship. She wore them as art, sensuous and hip, against the flesh and bone of her leg. Now she must sing the songs of the ballast people, their voices keeping time in her head as she runs towards the crashing waves, the sea walls widespread arms and the oncoming tide. Thank you. So, Staying along with, I thought I would think a lot about storytelling for this one. My theme would be different types of storytelling, you know, the origins of poetry, the origins of language. And so I found a few examples of that. This is from my book, Gentrifying the, the Plague House, also done by uh, the uh, you know, Prentice Press Publishing House at Loyola. So thumbs up to them. <laughs> <laughs> Excluding the coldness of my room and the strange ways of fathers. When I write this, I will say the house was narrow and that it overflowed with books whose backs were well broken by the hands of old men. I will say that he spoke to me in so many languages that my teachers feared for the sanity of my tongue. In my story, you bickered with him using the immigrant mouths of my grandparents because the things of which you spoke were the business of adults. I will write that you took me into the cauldron of our kitchen along with my sister and the aunties of your coven. Garlic would cleanse, I will say you said, and red wine forgive if you forget to find it in the coolest recesses of the house. And I will write that you were working with the crank of an ancient grinder or even a mortar and pestle when you explained to me that paprika could be almost tasteless if done the wrong way. If you did not crush the right pepper in the right way, it would give you its color, maybe a trail of its scent. And when you went to meet it, its flavor would only be a ghost haunting whatever was meant to bring you sustenance. I am um, particularly interested in the role of storytelling and sustenance in family cultures, um, how we create family folklore, things like that. And um, particularly interested because I found out after a few decades of life that my family actually came from Cuba and were Latinos. It was kind of an, oh, by the way. And the actual family name was Suarez. Like, so who are these people? So that's a long-term project. <laughs> that kind of leads me to this one. Again, the question of family and language, legend, and culture. Much later, she will edit this. If you see the typewriter woman come down, 
it will be to buy our longaniza and the fried cheese that goes with her wine and our coffee. She said once she could drink what we brew here, what we press here, because she learned about coffee from her D Damascus father. She was tiny and he gave her sips and spoons as he wrote with his tall script in the margins of a secondhand book or scribbled on the edges of beveled pages. You may see her in men's clothes, talking to the cappuccino women that cook here, that carry our kitchen smells and our butane heat home in their skin every night. She came to them on the day that she finally cleaned out her father's apartment. She came with her arms full of an antique underwood and she begged them to speak at her in unbroken torrents of coffee ground is Spanish and wax paper cooking oil until her morning time was done and the keys to the new place were properly blessed. Still thinking in terms of family and stories and reckonings with the past. Um, we all know the significance of Manzamar in the American Southwest. Okay, this is one of the places in which um, a massive internment camp was built during the Second World War for Japanese Americans, for Nisai Japanese Americans. Conjuring Manzamar. She has an obsession with bodies in motion, she said. I listen to her drink and wonder for a moment if the landscape of her face and the burnished desert of her skin, whether she is from the First Nations people that live just beyond the stretch of road. In this heat, she wears the short boots and tight black jeans of the bookstore girls I knew in Brooklyn. She wears a man's tank top and does her work through the lens of a 1943 Kodak Brownie that she took from her dead mother's attic. When she found the black box camera, it was full, it was full of her family. Tiny sepia negative Nisai shop owners disappeared into a wasteland like this one, vanishing like Yori, walking through the solid wall. And because the camera belongs to her now, she takes it to the empty spaces where the sand is still drunk with the rust of barbed wire. She takes photographs of the mountains, the desert floor, the white obelisk and a guard tower, saying that one day she will put them in a book about what grows in places where the disappeared are sent to find their new names. How are we doing time wise? We're good? <laughs> okay, good. Okay. <laughs> Keeping with this theme, this is my latest book, Father of the Red Grotto Used Bookstore. Yes, it's a long title. <laughs> but I'll read you the titular piece so you can get a sense of maybe why that is. Maybe. <laughs> Father of the Red Grotto Used Bookstore. Farther into your novel, I recognize myself as the father. You typed me as the patriarch who stacks the stocks of the family shop, who stands too tall for the small storeroom ceiling, who chose to paint a paint too red for a tribute to the gentrifying neighborhood gods. Farther into your novel, he grows as dog-eared as I have, as old men do living down dog-eared alleys in dog-eared days like these. He does not share my shaving of the sugar and coffee beard each day, and he does not chin himself on the most stalwart of the basement's pipes. He does take in tomes from the students who feel they have been betrayed and befuddled by them, from the wandering jigsaw women who swear they have learned enough from them, from the broken houses that pour out books like egg yolk. We, the novel father and I, both fill the store's scent with nutmeg and dust until the book stacks collapse and the place is blessed with a glorious tumult. 
farther along in your novel, when the hodgepodge people have grown loud enough in his head, he goes out of the house, as I did one night, with a paint redder than red, to dress the door of the family store and mark where the chosen children live. And with that, the companion piece. After the reading, she will sign copies. Tonight, straight out of the gate, there is Sriracha in her sweat. She is at a best-selling book signing, spice rising in clouds as she asks each one where they are from, inscribes a beloved copy, and drinks the whiskey that the booksellers have brought to her as a, as a tribute. There is a twisting tunnel carpal pain that struggles to thwart her as she slashes each book with her signature salutation. And later, she flounces her t-shirt in the heat, brawless a, conf a confession, and confesses that her father's bookstore grew to be the Masada of her childhood. That is why she wrote him as Esau. That is why she wrote him as Samson. That is why she made him swing his books like the jawbone of an ass. Thank you. Thank you. I love the ending of that last poem. That was great, Ed. Um, OK, so the last of our three leading poets is Joseph Ross. Joe Ross is the author of five books of poetry, including his most recent, Crushed and Crowned. His poems have appeared in many publications, including the New York Times Magazine, the Los Angeles Times, Poet Lore, Drum Voices Review, and the 2022 anthology, Where We Stand, Poems of Black Resilience. He has received multiple Pushcart Prize nominations and won the 2012 Pratt Library Little Patuxent Review Poetry Prize for his poem, If Mamie Till Was the Mother of God. He currently serves on the poetry board at the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, DC, where he teaches English and creative writing. Joe Ross's poems use their lean, coiled energy to recover forgotten ideals. Please help me to welcome Joseph Ross. Thank you very much, Shailene. Thank you, Clive and Sophia, everybody at the Pratt. I really appreciate you. Um, it's wonderful to read with Ed and Shirley. Uh, Shirley is a poet I've known for a long time and Ed is someone I met today. So I'm, and I'm really happy to hear both of your work and thank you all for coming out on a, a beautiful day when you could have been outside and it was it's 80, it's almost 80 degrees. Um, there's also a really wonderful and lengthy create, uh, open mic list. And, and I know that I'm the only one standing between you and the open mic. <laughs> uh, but I'm looking forward to hearing your poems too. I'm only gonna read uh, three poems. A couple of them have parts, so they're a little bit longer, but uh, I am a longtime high school teacher. I teach at a high school just right down by the US Capitol in DC. A couple of years ago, uh, some of my students and poetry students did a walking writing tour of um, places where Langston Hughes lived and wrote, lived and worked in Washington, DC. Uh, and so I wanna read a poem about that day. On a riding and walking field trip with seven high school students exploring Langston Hughes sites in Washington, DC. The city teaches us today with brick row houses and front stoops, bicyclists, the squeal of car brakes, hurried drivers watch us waiting on a sidewalk or riding on Hughes front steps. Bikes hiss by, their spokes sparkle against a gray sky. My students gaze at Langston's windows, wondering what poem began here? What poem ended here? What poem was tossed away? One moment, these boys are a riot of laughter, shining with silly, colliding with each other. The next, they search the sky for wounds. I watched them sitting on his stoop. These are serious boys, 
writing words they mean, seeking words that will be true in America. I wonder about these boys. Where do they begin? Where do they end? What loneliness or love will carry them? Thank you. Um, we're in the, the state of Frederick Douglass and the, one of the cities where Douglass lived. And so I want to read part of a, a, a lengthier poem in, in, the, um, in Crushed and Crowned uh, called The North Star in praise of Frederick Douglass. I'm just going to read the first few parts. One, a boy is born beside a bay that will one day free him, but not today. He flushes wet and bound from a mother he will not know. He remembered later that he never saw her in the light of day. He saw her only in the darkness after a day kneeling in the fields and in the pre-dawn blackness before her skin could begin to sweat. The first lesson his country taught him, memory is a wound. Two, his owner, Thomas Ald, would send him to Baltimore to a cousin whose home needed the service only an owned child can give, a dependence raw and sure. Ald's, Ald's wife taught him that shapes made letters, made sounds, made words, made possible and not possible. He carefully hid the spelling books white children left for trash. These letters, their curves and straight lines were sails. They could float across water that did not devour them. He drank them in the dark to conspire against the darkness itself. Three, these Christians moved him yet again to another plantation where he found others thirsty like himself. He taught them to read a New Testament, striking a flame in their throats. Neighbor slave owners discovered this rebellion of words, this paper revolution. They burst into it with sticks and guns. They cracked bones and skin to keep these words silent, to keep these throats thirsty and always near flame. Four, the first owner summoned him back, but now he was 16 years old. He was a lamp, a burning. This boy was a reading thirst. He could not be contained. He was beyond them now. But they had a weapon still, a man who breaks slaves, William Covey, a poor man whose name is Terror, whose reputation is as one who severs others from themselves. This reading boy will learn from him. Five, his skin learns many lessons, how long one can bleed before losing sight, how breathing in just as the whip strikes, can soften its cut. How a kind of silence confronts the breaker who whips you with a rebellious question, who is the animal here? He eats little. He thins out from the insides until his ribs have names. His wrist bones tell stories, but he learns to translate the hissing whip and the hands that hurl it. He learns there is a language here. Its language is unspoken, but its books are not hard to read or understand. And one day, during a beating that fractures almost everything, he looks into the breaker's eyes. He raises his hand to block the fist beating him. He takes hold of that man's throat, and even the air gasps. Everything breaks but him. Thank you. I want to finish with uh, what is the title poem of, of this book, and it's also a kind of an, a heavy poem. I'm a deep believer in the poetic form of the elegy, you know, the poem that describes or tries to bring back to life someone who is gone. It's probably one of the earliest poetic forms. We probably wrote it on, a, on cave walls or on the side of canoes. And in in I, my more, more uh, one book ago is a book of poems all about Dr. King raising King. And in reading that book, in, in researching for that book, I discovered two men, Echol Cole and Robert Walker. They were sanitation workers in Memphis who were killed. The poem tells their stories. So I won't say a whole lot more, but um, 
it is, I'm, I'm really, I think it's a really important idea, this idea of the elegy that brings people back to life. Not fully, of course, not physically. Maybe even more importantly, though, that names that might be lost to history, uh, we writers and readers can bring people back. So this is Crushed and Crowned, an American Requiem for Echo Cole and Robert Walker. The epigraph, crushed in the back of a Man Memphis sanitation truck on February 1st, 1968, because African-American workers weren't allowed to, to ride in the truck's cab. Their death sparked the I am a man campaign for better wages and working conditions. And this is the campaign that brought Dr. King to Memphis two months later, where he was assassinated in April, 1968. One, crushed. Some days, America is a jaw, steel-toothed and filthy. It's trash trucks all mandible and maxilla, dripping to devour what falls in, what is not allowed to sit where the humans sit. This jaw especially grins in Memphis, a city of music whose song sickens even the strongest humans. And these humans work. They rise and dress, show up and do what they promised to do. These are men who should not have to announce themselves to a city, a country that looks past them, their honest glory, a melody Memphis refuses to sing. Memphis only allows them to be grist, taken, seen, then unseen. This city's cruelty is treble and tooth, shocking even in America, whose cruelty is a jaw we know all too well. Two. Echo Cole, you were 36 years old, the veteran of your crew, in a city where black trash collectors walked, held on, sat in the back of the trucks, never in the cab, never touching the steering wheel with your able hands. It was coming up to 4.30 in the afternoon, a rainy, dismal day, one of those Memphis rains that leaves the city dirtier than before. As the rain fell harder, you sat in the back, trying not to get sick, trying not to bring a cold home to people who knew your name, whose names you loved. You were one of one. You lived on Danny Thomas Boulevard. You and Walker scooted into the back of the truck. You sat, he stood, when something shifted, something wrong. Metal jerked against metal in this truck everyone knew was in disrepair. And when metal slammed into metal, the ground beneath you moved. You looked up at Walker, whose hand reached out to you. You knew the city hired black men with arrest records because they were less likely to strike. You knew they paid you next to nothing. You worked full time and still qualified for food stamps. You knew about workman's compensation, but you also knew you didn't have it. All you saw was Walker leaning toward you, gripping your falling hand. Three, Robert Walker. You stood in the back of the truck above your friend Eckel. He was the old man. You knew you joked with him more than you should. When the truck limped toward the corner of Colonial Road and Vern Road, your knees buckled as the truck shivered, shook. You saw Cole slipping backward into something you could not imagine. So of course you reached out to him your strong, thick hand wrapped around his thinner, trembling arm. You didn't mind the rain. You just wanted to get home to five children and your wife swollen with number six. But it didn't take any thought for you to reach for coal until suddenly you lurched off balance too. He fell backward, you fell forward into a darkness with no name. The grinding came fast but not fast enough. You knew the truck was in disrepair. You knew Memphis was all about the, the blues. You knew you were a young man who could not go out this way when this way was unspeakable, unlanguaged. You knew your neighborhood, the city's Douglas neighborhood, was quiet this time of day. 
Still, your hand coiled around Cole's arm and you both entered a darkness, a jaw, a throat built to swallow you. You were young, but you knew the city would never help your wife. You were one of one. You love scrambled eggs and the flannel shirt you received last Christmas. You even loved the city uniform you wore to work each day. It meant something to you. You didn't mind being part of something bigger than your body. You just wanted a game of cards. Some days when laughter dared its way out of your mouth. Four, crowned. You both knew the funeral homes would hold your bodies because your families could not pay and Memphis, the city that crushed you, would not pay. What you did not know was this. Men would stand up. Men would announce that they were men. Men would walk in silence and demand the right to sit. Men would stand up straight and walk past shocked white families who had never seen their black fellow citizens ask for anything. They had never seen or heard or imagined you could. But something about memory is cruel beyond language. A thought cannot bring a dead man back to life. But our memories of you, your working hands rough as roads, your dismay at a white city's smugness, your punctual work habits, your clean uniforms, these tell us some of what we need to know about you. Your deliberate steps still march. Your quiet lives speak in the laughter of your children. Your beauty crouches in the shine of your skin after an honest day. These memories are not enough. They will never be enough. But this is how you breathe now. This is how you keep vigil over us now. This is how you live. This is how you lift us all into light. Thank you. Well, thank you, Joe. That was really powerful. And I want to just thank again all three of our future poets, Shirley Brewer, Ed Doyle Gillespie, and Joe Ross. Um, yeah, weren't they amazing? You are all lifting us up with your poems and showing us the way, so thank you. Okay, so now we come to the open mic, hooray. Um, just, I'm gonna call your name when it's your turn and please come up and read from using this mic. Um, I just wanna remind everyone again, the time limit is three minutes um, and if or less. You can read three minutes or less. This is our rule. Um, so I, our first up is Laura Hills, Laura. A good run. I loved warm restaurant bread served in a basket with rich dairy butter to ruin my appetite before the entree came. And gooey chocolate cake and pastries. Oh, the rugula. I loved French onion soup draped in cheese and colossal hot corned beef sandwiches from the Carnegie Deli on rye, of course, and Switzer's licorice bits. Oh yes, let's not forget the licorice. I loved baked lasagna and fried chicken and vanilla milkshakes so thick and big juicy ribeye steaks, medium rare, and french fries sprinkled with salt. Yes, with salt. I loved my dark brown hair and my piercing nearly black eyes and having lots of money in my purse to spend on treasures and delights without a care because I paid no bills. I loved living in a home so large 
that I could do and have in it whatever I dreamed of. And my mother, how I loved calling her on Saturday mornings to tell her what the children had been up to that week. I loved when my friends told me that they are getting married and having babies. Now they tell me of pains and illnesses, doctor visits and lab results and devastating losses, so many losses. I loved going to my annual physical and having my doctor smile at me and say, everything looks great, see you in a year. Now he tells me gravely with concern that everything is too high. My blood pressure, my cholesterol, my A1C, high, high, and high. He orders more tests, adjusts my medications, and keeps me on a tight three-month leash. I thought it would all last forever. That's how you think when you're young. Now I know better. At least I can say I had a good run. Okay. Thank you, Laura. That was a strong start. Um, um, Kumba Yasin, I'm sorry if I'm saying your name wrong. You can say, do you want to say it again? Hello, my name is Kaum Yasin. I'm really nervous. <laughs> um, I um, I'm, I'm a. Uh, she said three minutes, so I have um two poems in my, I've written. One of them says, "Why me?" It says, "Why me?" A child on the streets, cold, long nights with nothing to eat. Why me with no one to count on? Why me, God? Why was I born? Why me afraid of success? When deep inside, I know I deserve the best. And God answers. My child, you've had it rough, I see. But if you had it real good, you may not have prayed to me. So the answer to your question is, why you, my child? Why not? Thank you. The other one I'm going to share with you is called Thank You, God. It says, Thank you, God, for all you've been. My father, my mother, my lover, my friend. You've had your hands on me since I was a little girl, raped and abused in this cruel, cruel world. Thank you, God, for those you placed in my life. I know it's a reason, because you do everything right. Thank you for my children you let me borrow. I have to teach them the right way, because they're the leaders of tomorrow. Thank you, God, for all these trials and tribulations. Without them, I wouldn't be standing here with this strong revelation. God, if I had a thousand tongues, I could never thank you enough. Thank you, God, for all this stuff. Thank you. That was great. Next up, Rick Connor. I have a couple of a couple of poems here. I can read them in less than three minutes. The first one is called "Give Us This Day." It features um, my new favorite bird, the junco. Give us this day. I say, I stoop and bend like my grandfather did, grunt like the boars at the farm park do. Give us this day becomes give me a break. It's a slipped disc, I think, a pinched nerve, or a muscle yanked yesterday while stretching with contention, if not a lack of will to live. At night, I'm stiff and sore in bed, cold and old, wrapped in blankets and socks my grandmother knitted scores and some years ago. In the morning's pale sky and fresh snow, a blizzard of birds traffics in the crepe myrtle. One of them is new to me the dark-eyed, slate-gray Junko. With her pink beak and her one-pitch one trill, zzzit, 
a double scratcher, a snowbird, the silver bullet I'm always waiting for. Give me a break becomes give us this day. And with three hops or four and a vault, she's gone. Omen, apostle, mystic, bird. <clears throat> this poem features birds too, um, mockingbirds and vultures. It's called, I keep at bay what I might. Rumi says, give yourself away and in the great sea, you will be secure. I say, I keep at bay what I might. Ill health and indolence, loneliness and death. Ha, ha, ha. It's early to bed and to rise for me. Bran at breakfast and an apple a day, an hour's walk and an afternoon nap. Long may I live. One Saturday, I walked the same woods and fields, jumped the same stream, and find the well-worn path I always take to a bench in a quiet garden where I read and doze, languorous in the sun, where apple trees are alive with mockingbirds flashing their wings in a breeze, where winter grass goes to seed at my feet and turkey vultures circle gently above. I recall what I really am, a white wisp of cloud who floats over mountaintops without a trace, a little drop who keeps nothing at bay, but to gain the whole sea. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Um, next up, Thais Bennett. Happy 420, everybody. <laughs> I've written this poem when it was illegal to write this poem. I wrote it in 1976. <laughs> it's called The Traveler. I met an old friend passing me out on the interstate today. Out of a miracle, she recognized me through a quick glance of her rear view mirror. She stopped kind of suddenly and back a back a few feet to my a few yards to my feet. I praised this miracle, then I jumped in. I turned her on to a joint that I have been saving up for a few cities back now. We sat there nursing two joints while heading 85 down 81. She said she was going south for the winter, and I said I was going back west. I, I was going west back to school, and now she is old as a tune I used to sing to myself back in '72. She lit up a bow, and we both hit three times on a one-hit bow. By the last bow, my old friend was sounding like an old rascal tune showing up on a disco station. Old memories, old tunes, old times, grooving with an old friend of mine. By the time we reached Michael Junction, the old days seemed as if they had played all over again. My old friend hit me to a carpet ride flying joint back into my past. And I thanked her back with success, laugh, friendship, and peace again in the future. I pointed my thumb west and shook loose the chill that was on the back of my neck. I watched my old friend fly back into my past. And when she was out of my sight, I turned my head forward to, to, to continue this soul searching and ego tripping journey into my future. Thank you. Thank you, Thais. Next up, Brian Volk. Thank you. I've got time, I think, for two poems. This one is called Not Us Alone. 
and I think it's appropriate for this beautiful day. If, as we now know, trees consult their neighbors through microscopic fungi and congeries of roots, humpbacked whales commune in lengthy song, undulating utterance and plaintive moan, and honeybees dance to teach their sisters the day's new pollen path, might not the chattering birds debate what obscure purposes prompt our own quaint habits and ruinous compulsions? More to the point, might not our fellow creatures praise each in their own idiom all that is for the fathomless fact of being? Might not every living thing from ape to insect and sequoia to slime mold harbor some fervent devotion according to its nature? And who but the most narrow-minded materialist for whom consciousness itself is nothing but the brain's quaint parlor trick would deny that dogs love their humans in an earnest doggy way? Is it scandalous then to imagine that we from time to time, that when we from time to time declare our unmistakably equivocal affection for this world, that the world loves us back, that our erratic ardor for created things is more than matched, never passes unrequited. And, um, we heard some powerful poems already, so I, I uh, hadn't prepared for this one, but I'll read it. Um, you remember the episode in Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania, where the Amish community had the, uh, the um, gun wielder walk into the schoolroom and kill the girls. And uh, later the um, family of the shooter brought, uh, the family of the, the one of the, the family of the shooter was received by members of the community who brought them dinner and said forgiveness. Nickel Mines. Not that any of this, not that any of this is easy, but love your enemies, do good to those who, who hate you, has to be as tough as bequest to comprehend, much less follow. For if we pray as he taught, seeking forgiveness in equal measure to our forgiving, we show few signs of meaning it. Finding room for mercy when we feel sinned against rubs hard against the grain of our far more habitual exercise of steely retribution, while vague assurances of future bliss in return for present injury no longer move us as once they inspired martyrs. Small wonder then we're mystified when some obscure remnant, flawed as any, diligently puts flesh on the bones of words we've since pulverized into an edifying abstraction. Dismiss, if you will, these plain folk most find endearingly quaint, if impractical. Yet on the day their children were gunned down in a schoolroom, mark how they brought comfort to the now dead murderer's family. And when asked how in the throes of their grief they could so readily forgive its cause, fail to understand the question, having been shown how to do that all their lives. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Next up, Larry Henson. Thank you. Uh, I'm new to this poetry scene. I stumbled on it six months ago when I read that poetry helped improve your memory. <laughs> so I said, well, let me see if I can learn to recite a poem. So the first one I was uh, Shakespeare son at 130. My mistress eyes is nothing like the sun. So that was a challenge, but I learned it. So I decided to write a poem. Uh, very seldom is your role model the person you married to. The poem is called our rock, which is my wife, it could just well be called our hero. So let me try it. Her standard saw a challenge to meet, yet her steadfast presence makes us all complete. Through storms of stress, she steers us right our anchor in the darkest night. With order she reigns, 
chaos defied, her rules guide us side by side. A beacon of hope, a study guide, in her embrace, our fear subside. No accolades sought, just love and return for our rock and whom we discern. She's more than a title. She's a beating heart. We cherish her forever, our rock, our counterpart. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Um, next up, Charity, Charity Anastasio. Anastasio, sorry if I, if I mangled your last name. Hi, I'm Charity Anastasio. I'm a little nervous. <laughs> this is called Splendid Ways. We are dandelions in the mist. We are swaying like incongruous baby rockers. We are flattened by breezes and blowing our way free. Us ladies of the forest, us imaginative, secretly feminist, secretly cackling witches, fomenting escapes and radical thoughts, who slink about as normal ladies on Tuesdays and all days. I am lost in the pockets of my mind, lost in the pockets of time that cradle my hips, that twiddle their thumbs and look down Parisian noses at me. Pockets of potent conversations, careening missives for my lovely, slender and erudite, cunningly twined through our hair, hands, lives. Why do we have so many Salem witch retellings espousing the girls told truth? That there be witches here. It's preposterous. It's a love of the wicked, still, still, an American yearning for Baba Yaga to saunter forth from the forest, to wreak havoc on the sinister and the judgy, to destroy the village busybody, the village priss, the lying ladies of marriage and bliss. We want to lay waste to the village itself. I too am captivated. I too consider laying waste. <laughs> Thank you, Charity. Um, next up, King Fies. King Fies. Hear ye, <coughs> hear ye, hear ye. <laughs> How y'all doing? Yeah. My name is Fahim, the lady's dream. <laughs> And y'all are not as ugly as y'all seem. <laughs> it's like, no, some of y'all look more beautiful than me. Let me stop playing with y'all. But um, by a show of hands, how many of y'all like the win free stuff? Nobody? Oh, all right, cool. We got some people. All right. Um, well, my name is King Foz. Um, this is my first time doing poetry. I'm also a first time author. This is actually my self-titled book, King Foz Perspective everything you want to know to successfully navigate through life. So it covers everything we wish we knew when we were 16 years old, sex education, karma, et cetera. Um, but this is my first time doing this, so y'all got to bear with me. But uh, I'm going to take this seat one sec. No disrespect to anyone that's around. I think I'm going to stand up. For my generation, when it came to disrespect of parents, it was only Caucasian. It was never black and brown. But I guess things change because that's what I'm seeing now. It's all changed now. It's going down. We got to work. So the babies, watch the babies. But we don't find it strange that crackheads are selling services for pocket change. But we don't complain because that's the hookup. How else could you get your car washed? Your house clean for under 15. 
15 was the age of them big dreams. But now it seems 15 is the average age of pregnancies. Having them thoughts like they could never be. That's the mentality that's crippling. Read Willie Lynch if you don't get the scheme. It's so easy to reverse, man, it's sickening. How they got us doped up like methamphetamines on a concept that Corvettes and bling gonna better things when in reality, real estate and ownership is where the power be. They out getting it. We out shopping in the galleries. A good 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 gun popping in the galleries. We ain't all like that and we ain't gotta be. I feel it's time to change, so I gotta speak. Peace. Um, okay. <laughs> Again, my name is King Foz. Uh, follow me on Instagram. Uh, you can Google King Foz Perspective. You'll see flyers around. I'll pass them out or whatever. Um, but if you do want to win a free copy of the book, all you have to do is be the first one to follow me on Instagram. My Instagram is F-Y-Z-C-A-S-T. Again, that's F as in Frank, Y as in yogurt, Z as in zebra, C as in cat, A as in Alfred, S as in Sam, T as in Tom, Fozcast on Instagram. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you, King Fies. Next up, CB, the singing poet. CB, the singing poet. Good morning, everybody. And thank you. <laughs> this poem I did decades ago. Someone's knocking at the door, somebody ringing the bell. Someone's knocking on the door, somebody's ringing the bell. Do me a favor, open the door, and don't let them in. No, no, no. <laughs> Opportunity had the audacity to knock on my door yesterday. I shouted, go away. I can't handle you today. I'm not worthy of receiving any love from you. So you slowly walked away, feeling kind of blue. Adventure slipped in and asked, can I come out to play? I said, I can't accept the risk. Please go away. Then fear settled in and said, I'll stay a while. I'll never abandon you or give you a reason to smile. Solitude joined in and said, I bet I can make you cry. <laughs> Keep you sad and lonely until you die. Second chance said, oh no, I won't allow opportunity to fall. I'll seek out opportunity. I'll give him a call. Opportunity knocked on my door again. I said, you are more than welcome. Come on in. Thank you, Carolyn, CP, the singing poet. Next up, Pico. Okay, um, I literally wrote this um, about 20 years ago when I found out they was having a, um, a poetry reading down here. Uh, um, you know, I jumped on it, I had to come down here because I wrote this in this in this library. I was literally down here and um, me and my cousin, we was doing a lot of hip hop stuff and, and all that at the time. And um, I just freestyled this, I was at the, I was at the, um, the Caprita, and um, I was listening to uh, to uh, Pac, Tupac, then Mr. President, and um, I'm just sitting here like, damn, you know, because uh, he's from Baltimore too, partly, and um, I was Baltimore. I just, it just, I don't know, it just, it just came to me. It just, just came out. So this, this is, it's a quickie, oldie but goodie. It's called um, Attention, High Anarchy, uh, Baltimore City. 
My name is Citizen Stepped On, Stepping Back. I'm writing you today to inform you this regard, this equality must cease and has not slack. Let me start that over. I know, I know, I know. All right. My name is Citizen Stepped On, Stepping Back. I'm writing you today to give you informed regard that's, that this inequality must cease and has not slack. As I date the day of mine and many of its conditions, I'm at a loss of words. It's a sad state of affairs, but rarely and barely makes the news. Yet our conversation continues, escorting your mind on an unknown path to discover brand new venues. There are other options, of course, than exploiting the poor and strategizing their condemnation into the low paying labor pool forever. Realizing this would mean potential pay cuts, special tax bracket deductions, and illegal options of all kinds severed. So we continue on. Everything stays the same. Murder, drug addiction, children thinking it's normal and okay. Which it is normal in a matter of everyday living that they see constantly polluting their brain. Other cultures of people own businesses in my community. Meanwhile, I'm bombarded with barriers and roadblocked at every attempt and stride I make. This is preposterous and dare not to say a world geographic demographic land of the free fate. This isn't the first notice of discontent, but surely it will be one of the last. Soon other measures of action will be the only solution left to bring justice with tho for those without a voice to ask. Let's find a common middle ground where everyone can be happy or trading places will be the only le answer left sadly. I hate to see anyone live how we're forced to now, but we will abandon this destitute for your fortitude if that's all that's left gladly. We'll see how improvements come, if any. You've read our letter and know we're ready to move on our words at the speed of light and perfect timing gradually. Sincerely, Citizen Stepped On, Stepping Back. Thank you, Pico. Next up, Doug. All right, thank you, everybody. Uh, two short ones. Ain't, ain't not a word. Soon ain't no now I ever heard of. Maybe ain't no yes I ever heard of. Near ain't no here I ever heard of. Sort of, kind of, ain't no exactly I ever heard of. Like, like ain't no is I ever heard of. Fond ain't no love I ever heard of. All right, last one. Matha automatic firearm. Math is a weapon when it has a dollar sign. Math is a weapon when it is gambling. Math is a weapon when it is the stock market. Math is a weapon when it is rent. Math is a weapon when it is an interest rate. Math is a weapon when it is no money down. Math is a weapon when it is a utility bill. Math is a weapon when it is copay. Math is a weapon when it is a tax write-off. Math is a weapon when it is a fine. Math is a weapon when it is a bank fee. Math is a weapon when it is a plea bargain. Math is a weapon when it is a prison sentence. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Okay, next is Dr. Linda Payne. Greetings to each and every one of you this afternoon on this beautiful Saturday afternoon. Thank you to the Enoch Pratt Library for this opportunity to share a reading from my devotional uh, it is a devotional for daily living called You Can Keep a Good Wo Woman Standing, Sister Standing Firm in the Word. It is not just for women. It's for anyone who uh, would appreciate an encouraging, inspirational, and empowering word. I will be reading from my devotional, one of my poems, and the poem is called A Righteous Woman a righteous woman. We've heard the phenomenal woman by Maya Angelou. We've heard about the virtuous woman in Proverbs 31. This poem is called A Righteous Woman, A Righteous Woman. 
one that can be a tribute to all of the mothers. A righteous woman. You must not know about her. She is a woman worth far more than rubies and gold, striving to do good for her family all the days of her life. A woman of excellence, eager to serve God and others and work until the day is done. A woman who cares for, educates, and nurtures her children, clothing them in fine linens and scarlet. Fine linens, purple and gold, crimson and cream, royal blue and yellow are her favorites. You must not know about her. She is a woman clothed with strength, dignity, and honor, too, whose good works will speak for her in the gates. She is a woman fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of Almighty God. She laughs. Ha <laughs> ha! at all of those who think they know her, but they really do not. She is a woman of purpose on assignment by God. She knows the value of hard work, patience, and persistence will pay off. Her children rise up and call her blessed, a wonder to behold. You must not know about her. She is a woman of faith who fears the Lord, a woman of resilience and tenacity too, able to bounce back after a setback, take a licking and keep on ticking. Called, appointed, and anointed for such a time as this, so don't talk down to her or question her credentials. They are from Almighty God. You must not know about her. She is an ambassador for Christ. Saved, sealed, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, and fire baptized, a daughter of the Most High God. She is who God says she is, not the stained sinner others want her to be, a righteous woman transformed by the power of the Holy Ghost. Let her good works speak for her and praise her in the gates. Call her by her new name, the righteousness of God in Christ. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old has gone. Behold, the new has come. She is the righteousness of God, a righteous woman. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Linda Payne. Next, Malik Berry. <clears throat> What's good? <laughs> um, I have two short poems. One I wrote and one on phone because I'm ambidextrous like that. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> the devil on my shoulder is getting soft on me. He hasn't nudged me for anything all week. I haven't even, I haven't even heard a whisper of bad advice or joyful enabling of my bad thoughts from him. Just a hum to himself, a whistle to no one. Even the angel on my other side is starting to take up his position, and she's no good at it. The bad deeds go good, the rage comes out sweet. She can't even wish evil on a soul, because that just makes them want to be better. You try being told go to hell by someone with wings and a robe and not take that as a wake-up call. Maybe my devil can teach her some things, and she could teach him to be an angel again, for I need both to exist as they do each other so I can stand before you looking like heaven, but thinking like the devil. The glow from my halo will blind and distract you from the horns growing out of my temple and my forked tongue slithering to spit you back. <laughs> that one didn't have a title, but this one is called The Future. No flying cars, no pill capsule meals, Black Panther will praise, then join the Navy SEALs. No AI butlers, no ghosts in no shell. Oracle will sponsor your max security cell. You get all your choices in basic, silver, and platinum. Just pay an extra $6.99 for an arresting officer that's handsome. All hitmen will be unionized till a bill forms a new breed. Every defunct online thread 
is probable cause or a lead. The Jetsons and the Robinsons cover names. They're spies for the feds. They answer to Rachel Dolezal, our second black prez. We live in the now, and it's not good, but before the rulers can buy an immortal serum, stay upright, for those rulers can still die. Thanks. Thank you, Malik. Tom Hawkins. I'm gonna read these off my phone like a much younger person. <laughs> this kind of lot goes, uh, fits pretty well with the theme of the last poem. It's called Replaced by Robots. One afternoon we dressed as robots with metal tins tied with twine to our arms and legs and cereal boxes with eye holes and antenna over our heads. Janie was Wheaties and I was cornflakes. We clonked our way to the factory at the end of the lane and inside they put us to work. When the whistle blew, we tried to leave with our fathers, but even they insisted we stay. You're robots, they said. You don't need to eat or sleep. And they locked the doors behind them. They never came back because they'd been replaced by robots. I've got one more, uh, especially for anyone here who works in an office. It's called Please Include. Please invite Dr. Smith to this meeting. She needs eyes on this. Please include Mr. Jones. He should be in the loop. Please include Ted. He's working on the same thing, but different. Please include Annie. She needs to be involved. Please include Chad for situational awareness. Please include Kim. She has good ideas. Please include Jesse for perspective. Please excuse me. It seems this meeting is full. Thank you. Next up, Michelin B. I hope I said that right. Michelin B. Actually, in France, that's called Michelin. Uh, two syllables almost. Uh, but I would say Michelin like the tire. Still belted radial all the way. Um, anyway, I have this one I call I Am Wonder Woman. I proudly call myself Wonder Woman. That's because I am a total wonder how I made it this far. Take the other day. I finally bought a brand new TV. I love to watch comedy, also known as the news. I settled in my brand new lazy boy recliner with comfort dials. I had my life alert clapper. I had my insure cocktail. Voila, I was set to watch the anchors strut their stuff. The economy is still in the tank. Young people can't find jobs. Another scandal in DC is exposed. Exposed NSA leaks ad nauseum. They reported the news. Then they, they being the broadcasters, remind everyone that it's all the other party's fault. Next on the agenda are the Senate and the Congress. Then they report that success of the xyzhealth.info and its dysfunctional website. Really now, is that true? But what truly floored, floored me was the who was sponsoring the news. Viagra, depends, depression, pain, insomnia, social anxiety disorder, constipation, high cholesterol, thinning hair, restless leg syndrome, diabetes, heart disease, ad nauseum. My legs jump wildly in my lazy boy. I began hyperventilating. I was bombarded with diseases that I never even heard of. I wheezed for breath. I took a deep inhale. I tried to calm down. 
all I wanted to do was watch the news. Now the thrilling fix for all these maladies appeared. Their solutions catapulted me into hysteria. It seemed that no matter what the symptom, its remedy was worse. The cure could cause heart attacks, strokes, seizures, shingles, nausea, vomiting, sudden death, erectile dysfunction, and an overactive bladder. That's not to include my itchy, runny eyes due to decreased libido. Thank goodness I had my life alert clapper. <laughs> I barely could clap, but it activated 911. <laughs> I was completely frozen in my chair. Next thing I know, the medics busted down my door with the greatest of bravado. They raced me to the local ER in my lazy boy. I was in nirvana. The admitting clerk asked me for my insurance card. I had none. It was canceled because of the XYZ Healthcare Act. I cried and cried. I tried logging into the XYZ healthcare.info to no avail. She persisted. How do you want to pay? I blurted out, MasterCard, charge it! <laughs> Suddenly a swarm of doctors swooned around me. They poked, prodded, x-rayed, and examined me. Their official diagnosis was that I had none. They called in a shrink. She knew exactly what the problem was, sudden onset, tv -itis. She proclaimed this proudly. It's a cultural phenomena. What's the treatment? I muttered. She winked. Take two aspirin and call me in the morning. I signaled to the ambulance crew. Take me home. My MasterCard is maxed. I don't care. I am alive. I have sudden onset tv -itis. I proclaim proclaimed proudly, send the bill to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, Washington, D.C. And that, my friend, is why I call myself Wonder Woman. I am in constant wonder how I made it this far in life. All I know is that I will get through this. Yes, I will. After all, I am a living, breathing Wonder Woman. Thank you, Micheline. Um, okay. <laughs> okay, and we're getting um, near the end of the list here. You all are being a great audience. Thank you. So next up is George Young. George? So I'm trying to give you two short ones, uh, three minutes. If I die before I wake, I won't know that I am gone, but you will. Just remember to play my favorite songs, tell the jokes that I once told, play the videos on how we all got along. If I die before I wake, Shed a tear or two, even if it's fake. <laughs> Make speeches telling my good deeds. Be convincing. Make everyone believe. Protect my name, knowing that I was once good at playing the life game. If I die before I wake, Remember me. So when the gig is up, holding on to what was, not wanting to star track my way into wormholes, scared to take that next step, afraid to breathe my next breath, 
voices in my head have spirit my insecurities. I'll admit that I am afraid. Lions, tigers, and bears. Oh my. My daughter with Dorothy, when she cried, there's no place like home. There were no cell phones, no one to call. Thinking of my past confessions to E.T., I too was lost and all alone. I could not phone home. How do I face my biggest fears? After all these years, dancing with wolves was my claim to fame. So why now experience any shame? In my life, I walked in a lion's den. There has been sin after sin. So when the gig is up, shall I accept my fate, recognizing that I was a dollar short and a day late? Shall I drop down to my knees screaming, forgive me for all my bad deeds? Or shall I open my eyes? God, I'm sorry. The story is uh, my mom uh, was a poet. I'm the youngest one out of nine kids, not that young. I just turned 60. And um, out of the nine kids, I am the one with my mom's skill. And I'm sorry I screwed that one up, but it's a joke. <laughs> Okay, thank you, George. Um, <clears throat> Crystal Lynn. Thank you. My name is Crystal Lynn. I'm doing a piece. This piece is titled Vulnerability. Open Wound. Scab picked too soon, bleeding, hoping you'll bandage me. Like an injured animal searching for shelter, vulnerability can make you easy prey. So, I pray. I never fall for a wolf in sheep's clothing ever again. And that shelter I am searching for be God's mercy, God's grace, God's alignment. They say it's a cold world, and I've been bundled up in this coat forever, missing out on the sun against my skin, enjoying beautiful weather. But people have played with me, and I don't know if I'll ever be the same. Petty, the type of petty that if you don't like my, I won't like yours either. If I feel like you're acting brand new, I'm through. I don't want to be this way. So I ask God for healing. I come kneeling, open wounds, scars, and all. I ask for forgiveness. I know this isn't in your image. I want to be better. I want to let them in. But every time I get the nerve, I feel sick. The type of sick that has my stomach twisted in knots. Knots rising up my throat, catching my tongue. Tongue tied, can't speak, knees weak. Want to run away, but I can't move. So I remove myself emotionally. Now I'm emotionally unavailable. Grab your rock climbing gear because you'll need it. I've built a fortress. Lock myself in a castle trapped inside with fire breathing dragon. I, I am both princess and dragon waiting for night. Oh, but baby, no one is coming to save you because you are also night. In this story, shining armor won't get you out. You'll have to shed some of that armor to be set free. I was taught, big girls don't cry, they get even. I've learned that when seeking revenge, be sure to dig two graves. One for your enemy, the other for yourself. I've died many times, stupid to the level of someone else. God, I need your help. Vulnerability, it ain't easy. I've been wrestling with this for so long, becoming my worst enemy. Stuck in a me against the world mentality, reality. The battle was always me versus me. Thank you. Again, my name is Crystal Lynn. 
Uh, I am a poet in the Maryland and D.C. area. I do performance pieces. If you would like to follow me, you can follow me at crystal.lynn1026 on IG. Thank you so much. Thank you, Crystal Lynn. Steph Zion. Hello, beautiful people. <laughs> All right, so I'm Steph Zion. I'm a spoken word poet and a self-published author of my book, Reflections of a Hopeful Romantic. So I'm gonna be reading a piece I wrote, it's called To My First Love Language. Dear Poetry, I'm sorry for those times I place you on the back burner. You are my backbone so the world can't break me. You are the rhythm in my life that brings deep meaning, the reason I'm still breathing despite my deepest wounds from life heartaches inflicted on me. Poetic words adorn my wounded, melted skin. Words are etched for sweet whispers that promise healing within. Each poem soothing scars deep, ink of poetry a remedy to keep. With every stroke, pain begins to subside as healing melodies within me reside. Weaving tales of love, pain, loss, and hope, and my passion for mental health. These topics so dear to my heart, sharing words of healing through the soothing art. My poetic ink flows and seamless patterns embraced by all of my curves and edges. Never judges my holes or fill my voids with empty nothings. You accepted to hold me, so no need to hide to mask my broken parts in your eyes. I see love's abstract art. My wounded canvas cherishes the cracks and imperfections, embracing my essence with no exceptions. My poetic display makes me feel the most seen, oh so therapeutic like a dream serene, and though the wounds of my past may ache. The poetic verses mend the tapestry of resiliency they gently blend through the highs and the lows we cope. We can find the beauty in love, pain, loss, and hope. Inscribed upon my skin, a testament so true. My words tattooed across my wounds can heal and renew. Through the years, my love for you grew, a lifelong passion forever in view. I put my pen to paper, always giving it my best, breathing in greatness. My lungs are filled with gratitude and zest, knowing that each moment with you, I am deeply loved and immensely blessed. To my first love language, I will always, and I mean always, love you so dearly. Sincerely, Stephanie. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, if you like my work, you want to support me, you can follow me, Steph Zion One, on Instagram and TikTok. Again, it's Steph Zion One, S T E P H Z I O N One. And you can also check out my website, impactgreatness.com, to learn more about me and my work. Again, thank you so much. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, next up, Zoe Nordquist. Oh, um, wow, hard to follow both of those. Those were amazing. Um, <clears throat> I think we've all had a role model or a mentor that was very important to us in our lives. And as we grow up, we learn that maybe we're not as important to them. You know, your teacher only has, or you have one teacher that's your favorite and they have many students. So if you'll humor me, this is called Playing Favorites. <clears throat> Cooped in a studio, you lead me through uncharted waters 60 minutes a week. Together we explore the infinite expanse of artistry where serenity more intense than I find in my own safe bed penetrates my awareness. I don't think I'm a narcissist, but this hour fills my hourglass and I love feeling full and complete despite many imperfections. You laugh off my mistakes and I believe you believe in me, which makes me believe in myself for once. Every detail of our lessons roots in my mind. A beam of blinding sun sneaks through your window at 3.04 this time of year. The musty smell of manuscripts tends to make you sneeze. The rhythmic pulse of an open string resonating within these walls. I'm convinced you are a magician, casting spells with a violin. You hold my attention for ransom, manipulating my emotions with sound and motion, every shift surprising, every stroke captivating. Slowly, I think I am learning to mind the subtle details too. You are a green-thumbed gardener, cultivating my abilities, building me up until I blossom all on my own. I may not be the best you've ever seen, but in your care I know I deserve to be here with you. We converse after your concert discussing Dvorak's delicious in intricacies when another pupil approaches. 
Overcome with joy, your attention soaks him up, a tall drink of water for your parched interest. Was I merely an arid breeze drying you out? I don't get an introduction. You refuse to look my way. Your body's shifting subtly to slowly shut me out. No longer included, I raise my hand in farewell, politely slipping away, neither acknowledged nor noticed. Cooped in a practice room, I caress my instrument, waiting in silence for that sense of peace when I notice a beam of blinding sun peeking through my window. It's 517 and the musty smell of manuscripts refreshes me like a summer breeze. I still know the pulse of an open string resonating within four walls, and I find I would rather be here than in my own safe bed. I alone, I pursue undiscovered mysteries. Alone, I approach new horizons in my concerto and hear the universe whisper to me with your voice. Try it like this. The floodgates open. Creativity spews out of me now like a crime scene across the piano bench. My soul is soaring, and yet you are not with me. Together we wove a lie, and my heart clung to it. We deceived me into thinking I earned a place here with you because of you, but my fears were mere fiction. I don't belong here with you, but a song was always in me. Music is my native tongue. I belong to this craft with or without your instruction. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. Okay, I think we just have two more, if my list is correct. Um, is Stacy Linnell here? Stacy, you're up. Stacey Linnell, and uh, this is the first time that I'm doing this in a long time. Now, my um, poem is a little racy, so I hope that you all are ready for some spice. Okay. It is titled, Nobody Respects the Pussy, Especially the Black Pussy. Now, that not the doctor that assists you in birthing your legacy or more would have expressed more concern with the IUD and the extreme highness of the STDs. And now the people in the crispy dark suits tell us we just can't. We can't control anything when it comes to our pussy. That should, ex that should express to you the power of the pussy, especially the black pussy. They've tried demeaning us and sexually exploiting us through videos as we worked our way up from the stripper pose. See, behind that mask, we saw our vision and goals. Our education became our focus, knowing the future was just us. They've turned our men against us to try to control our black girl magic. They've been stealing us and killing us, and yet we hold space for their silenced pussy. Nobody respects the pussy, but you lie to get it. You perpetrate a fraud, which you think what we want to hear in order to live in this fantasy world of the love you never received from mommy or daddy. And so you take it out on the pussy. Every woman you come in contact with because you don't want to kill or destroy mommy or daddy. So you terrorize the pussy that you can't get enough of, that you are, let's keep it real, jealous of. The way of our, the way that it gives life for every drop, it flows waters. Waters, that way that, that lubricant, the way of the next generation of our daughters. And nobody respects the pussy because they perceive it to be weak. It's pink, soft, wet, and it's where life begins and is complete. Pussy gets ripped and raped and torn, and it heals from others' mistreatment, even from ones where they were born. Pussy gets a bad rep like it ain't tough. We can push out a 10-pounder one week and take care of six inches in six weeks after birth. <laughs> They've always seen its worth. That's why we're always had to fight for the right just to give birth. Because pussy is the ninth wonder of the world, and they still don't understand it. Why are black women still dying at an alarming rate from childbirth? Because our pussy is too fertile and we are taking over. White people are not having children like we are. So nobody respects the pussy because of the fertility it holds, especially the black pussy. <laughs> Thank you, Stacey. Um, Cassiopeia, I think you're our last 
Oh, did I miss somebody? Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, oh, okay. Um, okay, come on, come on up, or, or one of you can talk, <laughs> and then we'll be, and then we will close the event. Thank you, everybody, for staying a little past when we. Sorry, I didn't see the paper, but I signed up online. My name is Emily Crespo, and uh, thank you to the re featured readers. You guys were amazing. I have like paprika and nutmeg in my head and everything now. Um, so, gosh, it's Baltimore. I started doing spoken word here so long ago, and I really have all these great poems I've written in the last like 20 years, but I just want to read a spoken word poem and see if it's still in there um, for you guys. So here we go. To think of the forever lost, the cost or tried and did for what is a rock in a hill and an urge to push until wings beat the air with a silvery shh. Salvation, my soft angel, has cradled my limp expectation, able to fathom by vocation the love, and I fled for his 1 a.m. street lamp pools of light. My cries are signs of stretching fields within me, tearing yields to a new growing me that I cannot now see. Her knee against the groin of dawn is fierce but ignorant, for change has not come to be an easy eye upon this brow, nor to sweetly say things clearly, but nearly to kill every way out of facing its lidless, unmasking power. So how, how to be in a room, how to grasp at the flower after pain. I have done this and again done this. My angel returns after his 1 a.m. street lamp rides. My cries within me stretching fields. He, oh, he, my soft angel ar arrives after his 1 a.m. street lamp pools of light, rides, stretching within me, tearing yields to a new growing me that I cannot now see, holding a talesman aloft, a simple toy. I take and spin the wheel, it turns and stops, absurd and not what I have got for all my fragile flower thoughts. He flees, taking with him time where I walked free. A plague descends, burden sad and seed finds loamy soil in my fertile need to constantly hold a skein at the loom of fate, though the coiling waters sublimate beyond today, finding new form, I lose my way. What light, what change, what light do I have to no change? How brings my ba angel bastard hope and flame such absurd gifts to think forever could not wait to bring me this? Okay, that is... <laughs> It's amazing that it's still there. One poem for you guys, one poem for somebody else that um, I've been trying to write a, a poetry about pe other people's adventures and um, different stories about people that have done amazing things in life. And I'm trying to find this one about Dashrath, Dashrath Manaji, um, who was an amazing guy. There's actually a documentary about him but I cannot find it. I may have to just tr ask you to go look it up then since I can't find my poem. One second. Yeah, Emily, if you could maybe get, do you have a website? You yeah, can, I don't, yeah, I don't have a website, but or, I have, I have. Um, or an IG or something. Mm, I'll have, you just have to look me up, Emily Crespo. Okay. <laughs> yeah, everybody Google Emily Crespo. Thank you. Um, okay, um, Cassiopeia, you wanna close us out and Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Sonnet for the solar eclipse. An angel's halo blacks the light above, a beauty held in mesh behind the fold, as presence spout an otherworldly love, inducing only mere ephemeral blindness, the death of all that seeks the eyes. I dare not sacrifice my future days. Forgiveness begged from unforgiving sighs is fruitless as the shield from quiet rays. If sense is lost, then emptiness will follow, and thus I must protect my fragile sight. But is a life in shade not just as hollow? Don't eyes behind their, li don't eyes behind their lids see only night? One must risk it all to catch the wig, a lifetime of regret and just a blink. My name is Cassiopeia, and none of you could follow me anywhere. Thank you. Okay, well, um, 
just I'm just coming back up to say um, thank you everybody for being a terrific audience and thank you for all the open mic readers. You were fantastic. Email list if you're not already on there, so we can have you back for other poetry readings and open mic events and to purchase our feature books on the side. Um, uh, have a great night. No, thank you. <laughs>